tonight on the fifth estate. It was a dream assignment, the Arab Spring. A Canadian journalist in Egypt covering an historic revolution. But then the journalist came under suspicion. Mohamed Fahmy was arrested in the middle of the night, caged in a courtroom, convicted of being a terrorist, and thrown into a dingy cell. Now, out on bail, awaiting a new trial, he sits down with the Fifth Estate for his first television interview. Tonight, Mohamed Fahmy tells us he was a victim of politics and a negligent employer. We were pawns at the end of the day. That's what happened. Mr. Fahmy, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. It must be very good to be free. It feels really good. When did you first realize that this chapter was finally over for you? Well, uh, it's just, uh, they came to me at five in the morning and they said, you're going home. And uh, it was a real shock for me and uh, started grabbing my stuff and preparing to go home. And they dropped me at the police station. My brother came, picked me up and I showed up and my mom was ecstatic. She was in tears of happiness, of course. And uh, it was a great experience to just be back home and in your own bed and not worry about the police and start using your phone and just, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good feeling to be free. And this was after 412 days of that not being correct. free. That is correct, that is correct. Very long 412 days. I think it's okay for us to reveal now that the Fifth Estate has actually been in communication with you for a lot of the time that you were incarcerated. Uh, and I think through that we've had a real sense of the roller coaster that this has been for you. What was the, the most challenging time for you? The most challenging time for me was definitely solitary confinement in the terrorism wing of a super maximum scorpion prison where one month with not much, no sunlight and no watch to tell time and being really separated uh, from your family and not knowing what will happen. And you know, it, it, it's tough, but um, you get over it after a while with the support of other um, prisoners. And I, I believe without the support of the media, it would have been much harder knowing that somebody out there is vouching for you and keeping your story alive. That's what really kept me going. Now this is all obviously after you were convicted. I want to take you and back though to the beginning of this. Take me back to 2011. You made a very deliberate decision at that point to come back to Egypt. Why did you do that? I came back uh, on January 25th of the Egyptian revolution, first day, because you know I realized something was happening. So there was a real call for change. And like many Egyptians, uh, I was very hopeful that, you know, there will be a better Egypt, there will be a better economic uh, status and improvements on many levels. He remembers the time with excitement and with pride. In just 18 days, a three-decade-old corrupt and brutal regime was gone. Egyptians had done what for so long had seemed impossible. And uh, when Mubarak was removed, uh, we were, I was very happy and excited. And I decided to stay here and I, and I worked here for three years as a journalist. And I was indeed really hopeful that there'll be more freedom of expression, there'll be more freedom of assembly, and that we would have the Egypt many people wanted. Do you remember being in the crowds that day that Hosni Mubarak went? I was working for CNN and I was outside the palace of Mubarak uh, and when it happened you know you know journalists don't really cheer uh, when this happens but the crowds actually carried me on their shoulders and I, I was caught on camera being jubilant. <laughs> <laughs> I think every Egyptian was caught on camera being jubilant yes. that day. Yes. The other momentous thing I think that happened to you upon your return was that you met the woman who's now your fiance. Yes. Who was not at all political, unlike you. No, she was not political. She had no Facebook or Twitter. She had no Twitter account and she uh -huh. was not engaged in politics. Gradually she became, you know, part of my support system and she would send me the news while I was, you know, busy doing something else and she became, you know, very close to me and when this uh, 
the crisis started, she became engaged with the media and you know lawyers, and she became my biggest advocate, and uh, she's my hero, basically. She's your hero? She is. Yeah. While Marwa and Mohammed cheered Mubarak's exit, like many of their countrymen, they were quickly disenchanted with what came next. Egypt's first democratic elections brought the Muslim Brotherhood to power, led by President Mohamed Morsi. Within just 18 months, public sentiment was turning again. Well, you know, you witness the elections and you, you hope for a democratic process. And, you know, we know that the Muslim Brotherhood were the most organized political group on the ground. Um, and then they, you see them in power, but also I felt that Egypt wasn't the same Egypt that I've known, you know, the, the, that fabric of the Egyptian society uh, was not there, you know, and uh, even through the coverage, even my family, the, the women in my family were not feeling safe. Uh, there was a lot of harassment on the street, um, you know. You did, though, at one point go out and, and protest yourself. You joined the crowds that, that were calling correct. for Morsi's uh, departure. That is correct. After I left CNN, there was a three-month period where I wasn't working, so I was allowed to chant as a private citizen, yeah. not a journalist anymore. And I, yes, I did join the, group, the crowds, and I chanted against the Muslim Brotherhood, and I called for change. By the summer of 2013, change had come. The military was back in power in Egypt, and Fahmy had returned to journalism, where he'd soon find himself in a political minefield. He'd taken a job with the Al Jazeera network, owned by the government of Qatar. Qatar had long supported the Muslim Brotherhood, an issue for Egypt's new rulers who would soon outlaw the Brotherhood. <laughs> Accusing Al Jazeera of bias, the government raided its offices, banned the network's Egyptian service. But Fahmy was clear he was going to work for the English service. And from its temporary headquarters at the Marriott Hotel, he was determined to put as much distance from the Egyptian channel as he could. From day one, I made that distinction in our reporting, in our sourcing, in our interviews, and that we were completely independent. But I feel that, you know, the Egyptian government didn't see it that way. They felt mm -hmm. that it's all just one toxic brand. How difficult was that for you in those, in those few months leading up to the arrest? Uh, it was very difficult because uh, I arrived as the bureau chief and the whole staff was panicking. They had no clue why they're working in the Marriott, what the legal situation is. And I've sent emails uh, specifically asking Al Jazeera, why are we here? Are, are, do we have the right licenses? What, when are you going to issue press passes for us? You and asked them specifically. I did. Are you licensed to operate in Egypt? Yes, I did. And I then, asked. And you were told what? I got a very vague response, you know, stay out of these legal issues and we will handle that from Doha, stick to the editorial uh, part of your job. But he soon found the editorial part was being compromised as well. Even though it had been banned, Al Jazeera's Egyptian channel continued broadcasting from abroad illegally and, according to Fahmy, started poaching material prepared by the English channel. The first time I flagged it, they removed it. The second time, I saw it happening again, but this time they went all out. They brought in guests and they brought in analysts and split screen and graphics. And that really angered me and my team here. So we've, you know, we highlighted it again very aggressively and we were making phone calls, you know, but it was too late. It had ran on both the Arabic and the Egyptian Al Jazeera uh, channels. And, you know, that is fine if you're in a network, you know, we, all networks share content. It's fine. But when you have a, that arm of the network has been shut down by a, a court order and you continue to do that, <laughs> You're basically telling the police and the government to yeah. come and get you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and that's what happened. Why do you think they would want to operate here, apparently without a license? Uh, why would they not be bending over backwards to provide you every security that they could? I think it's putting the story ahead of the journalists, you know, that they wanted to keep 
getting the story and, you know, at any cost, and they continue to challenge the Egyptian government, you know, when you're in a country and you're told you're not welcome, you know, the least you can do is either try to resolve the situation or just leave. You know, don't bring a new bureau chief and staffers and fly them in while you know that, you know, things are not going to work out. Let me ask you, though, then, when you, when you discovered this, why did you stay? Why didn't you just quit? When you do see mistakes happening, you assume that they will be corrected. And I've only worked in, as a bureau chief for three months. Yeah. And, you know, you get a response that, okay, we're working on it. Um, we will solve it. And then suddenly you realize when the cops come to arrest you that none of this was happening. You know, I'm sure as, as difficult as it was, you didn't understand until that night, December 29th, just how much trouble you were in. Tell me about the night that you were arrested with your colleagues. I was in that same hotel where we're doing the interview right now in another room and the doorbell rang. There, it was a security officer dressed as a waiter. So I opened the door and suddenly there was about 15 officers and uh, a camera was rolling, a video camera and photography flashing, mm -hmm. and I was, it was a complete shock. If you see the video, you'll see the shock on my face. I was really, really shocked. The next night, the video was all over Egyptian state television, complete with sinister music. They didn't know it yet, but the journalists were about to be charged as terrorist sympathizers. And they, just, they, they stormed in and uh, they just started searching the room and... What did you think was happening? No, I realized what was happening, but I didn't realize that how bad it's going to be. When we come back, journalists go to jail. journalist Mohamed Fahmi was simply doing his job when in December 2013 he and his Australian colleague Peter Greste were arrested. To their astonishment, they, along with the third Al Jazeera producer, were charged with fabricating the news and conspiring with the outlawed Muslim Brotherhood. Charges so serious, Fahmi ended up in Cairo's notorious Scorpion prison in a wing reserved for terrorists. Well, when we were arrested, uh, me and Peter were kept first in a police station in a very crowded cell where, uh, you, you know, you could barely lie down on the floor and have space to turn your body around. And then we were separated and uh, he went to a different prison and I went to that super maximum security scorpion prison where, you know, you're imprisoned with the Muslim Brotherhood leaders, uh, Al-Zawahri, the brother of the Al-Qaeda leader, and some really hardcore jihadists who had just returned from Syria, Libya, and they were coming back to, um, you know, attack the regime here and topple the regime here. And uh, it's, uh, it was a pretty tough experience, i got to say. This video, smuggled out by another journalist, shows the conditions. It was in a cell like this that Fahmy spent a month in solitary confinement. Yes, the solitary confinement was uh, pretty intense, and um, I was treated as a terrorist. You know, I even had my arm was broken, but they still insisted that I be handcuffed to other jihadists during the transfer to the prosecutor, and it was it was it was intense. Uh, it was a freezing. It was winter. You know, the cell is infested with uh, insects. And How did you get through that, though? I mean, uh, it's a, quite a shock from going from running the Al Jazeera bureau in the Marriott Hotel to being in that, that prison. That is correct. Yes, you know, you have to be very, you know, you have to take care of your spiritual side, your mental side, and um, you know, I, I tried to just get my hands on anything to read. Um, after a while, I was able to smuggle a watch in. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew what time it was? At least. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, you, 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 you know, human beings go on in life wondering how much threshold uh, they can handle. And at, at these situations, you'll be surprised. You know, your body starts to adapt in a... Um, you know, physically and mentally. And, <laughs> and you also, from accounts I've heard uh, from you, uh, became friendly with, with some of them. You, there was a camaraderie that developed in, in that wing. 
With, uh, with jihadists? The yes. Yes, of course, because, you know, inside all the masks drop and you're, there's no more classification of, you know, who you are and what you're doing. It's about survival. So, yeah, you know, we, we had a sort of communication at night through the bars, you know, discussing, you know, what they're doing in Syria and whatnot. You know, us journalists, you know, risk our lives to get these stories on the front line. And now it's right there in front of me. So, you know, I was picking their brains and trying to figure out what they're doing and whatnot, and mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about uh, them killing you or beheading you, if I might say. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, you know, humor is very important inside prison too. Just like the front line, sometimes it's so intense that yeah. you need to have some humor to get, to get by. During that time, you, as you say, you kept assuming that at some point, I guess, somebody was going to realize a mistake had been made here and that, that you would be released. But then it becomes clear you're not going to be released and you will, in fact, go to trial. Um, as that trial approached, mm -hmm. were you optimistic that this was going to turn out well for you? Yes, yes, I did. I did because, um, you know, I was sure that, you know, we never fabricated any news. And I was definite that, you know, not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So you go in there thinking, you know, that's a big mistake. It's going to disappear. But it didn't disappear. The trial that followed will long be remembered as one of Egypt's most bizarre. With the accused in cages, their friends and families packed the courtroom and watched in horror as the prosecutors laid out the so-called evidence. We decide to take the long way around. News reports the journalists had prepared for other networks in other countries. 20 years of urban warfare does to a city. And you said you felt so happy you could die. Music videos that were found on their phones. Like everyone, Fami was stunned. And I told the judge when I spoke, you know, I spoke to the judge several times and I told him, you know, I would love to defend myself. If you give me a chance, if you show me what I did wrong, show me where is the evidence. <laughs> And he was as deaf to that as he was apparently blind, given his sunglasses? Yes, I mean, you know, the judge, uh, the issue with the sunglasses. I mean, I, I felt that the judge was responsive to me, and uh, I never thought I would be sentenced at all. That this court is a political case. We are political prisoners. But what Fami didn't know, and what the Fifth Estate has learned, is that the prosecution actually did have testimony that Al Jazeera tried to manipulate coverage. Bahar Muhammad, the third journalist charged, told police interrogators the network was biased in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood and instructed its journalists accordingly. The report of his interrogation was never produced in open court, so the media never saw it. Fami, who told us he was never told the slant coverage, only found out about it later. When you learned uh, that what Bahar had said to those interrogators, what was your reaction? I was fuming. I was very angry because I realized that, you know, there is something here in these so-called confessions that can make us look bad. And uh, I spoke to Beher about it, and he made it very clear that he was sort of pressured. And so you went to Al Jazeera and said, we have to fight this, because this, this is potentially harmful. Yes. And, and, and the judge referred to the, these confessions in the, um, the verdict report, the judgment report, and, after and, that. And what did Al Jazeera say? They basically acknowledged the fact that these confessions exist, um, I'm very surprised that their lawyer, the network lawyer, did not contest them in the first phase of the trial. Why do you think Al Jazeera didn't contest them at the time? I think they didn't want the headlines and the sort of negative media. It didn't make sense to Fami, but then a lot of what his employer did didn't make sense. For instance, in the middle of the trial, with their own journalists fighting for freedom, Al Jazeera decided to launch a $150 million lawsuit against Egypt for shutting its offices. What was your reaction when you heard that? Furious. 
Uh, this is part of the geopolitical score settling I'm talking about. Uh, you know, when their own network lawyer tells them, you, if you do this, this, this will harm the journalists in the cage. Mm -hmm. And they still go on and sue Egypt in the International Economic Court for $150 million against their lawyer's uh, advice, that, that's, that's not acceptable. But even with all of that, on the day they filed back into court to hear the verdict, Fahmy was confident he and his colleagues would be exonerated. The judge's words landed like a bombshell. Guilty. Fahmy was going back to jail for seven years. When you heard the, the sentence, the conviction, what went through your mind? It was like being punched in the face, literally, by, you know, Muhammad Ali. You know, some, it felt bad. I could feel my knees, like, weak in the knees. I could feel, you know, they always say the courtroom was filled. It was like it went silent. You know, I could not really, you know, feel what was happening. And I don't know if you saw the video, I was very angry, and the cops were trying to get me out of the cage. And when we went outside, they really sort of, became a bit, you know, aggressive with me and they wanted to, uh, you know, they mishandled me a little bit in terms of, um, with all of us actually, they just, you know, they're very aggressive with us. It's a very tough moment because I had planned the celebration for knowing that I'm going into that courtroom and I, I was planning, you know, who we're inviting for our wedding uh, and during the last visit before the trial, I had sneaked out a celebratory speech that I wanted journalists to, you know, read. Yeah, and it, when we went back to that cell, it, it, it didn't hit us yet that we are now convicts and we have to change our white attire to the blue attire reserved for convicts. And it only hit us the next morning when I opened the newspaper and I could see photos of my fiance and mother crying. Seven years, he killed, whom he killed, whom he killed. No, 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 I don't wanna. That's when it hit me and I think that, that was the first time I broke down, I think, yes, definitely. And when we come back, the campaign to free the Al Jazeera 3, and politicians are called to act. Hundreds of days in detention. Mohammed Fahmy has criticized Al Jazeera for failing to protect its journalists before they were arrested in Cairo. But after they went to jail, the network swung into high gear. Imagine a world where reality is distorted. Imagine being kept in the dark about major global events. You've just imagined a world where journalists are not free to report the facts. In a campaign orchestrated by Al Jazeera, journalists around the world join forces to condemn Egypt and to call for their colleagues' release. And we will leave no stone unturned. We need to ensure that justice does prevail in Egypt. Two weeks ago, Peter Greste was released and deported back to Australia. Mohamed Fahmy says he was told he could also be deported to Canada, but first he had to give up his Egyptian citizenship. You came back to this country because mm. you believed in Egypt and you wanted to help Egypt in this mm. great moment or what appeared to be a great moment of, of time. How hard was it for you to, to sign those papers saying that you were relinquishing your attachment to this country? I refused at first when, they, when these security officials came to visit me. And when I did, they, they gave me the phone, the mobile phone, they said, hey, speak to this 
high official in a certain security apparatus who was you know, very clear in the sense that if you want to get out of this case, that's your only way out, you and Peter, that's what he said. As, you know, so and this was somebody from? The Egyptian government. The Egyptian a, government. Yes, definitely, from a secu security apparatus in the Egyptian government. And they told you if you gave up your citizenship, you would be deported? The only way out. The only way out. That is correct. And uh, he said, you know, you can all, the nationality is, is in the heart. It's not a piece of paper. And you can come back as a tourist. And, you know, it's, 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 it's very, you know, it's an insulting uh, process. But if you're in prison and that's your only way out, so I signed. And uh, I informed the Canadian embassy on a day by day, hour by hour of everything that was going on regarding that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, my lawyers were engaging directly with the government, with the um, embassy. And, you know, we were uh, preparing ourselves for that outing out of that case. And Peter did go. Peter was deported. Very happy to see Peter deported. He's, and uh, he's you like believed a that mine, your <laughs> your de uh, that was going to happen to you imminently is what you were you were saying and tweeting at the time. That's what our foreign minister, uh, Mr. John Baird, said, and that really resonated across the Middle East. That word imminent. The family of Mohammed Fami has applied for his deportation to Canada, and they say they feel it could be imminent. So why didn't it happen? Do you think? I, I really don't know. All I know is that, you know, Canada may have not exerted enough pressure to seal the deal. You've been very critical of Prime Minister Harper in particular for not doing enough. I'm thankful to the Canadian government for taking on my, you know, this kind of support they gave me, especially the councillor staff here in Egypt who have done a lot for me in terms of making sure I'm fine and everything. But yes, you know, the, the Prime Minister, I called on him. Amnesty did, Human Rights Watch did, my lawyer Amal Clooney wrote him several times asking him to just, you know, make that phone call. Do you know for a fact that he didn't make the phone I call? I know for a fact that he didn't because, you know, my fiancée visits the presidency and she visits the ministers and she sits around with the junior ministers in the presidency and I know he didn't. You know, I'm asking him to do so because, the you know, the deportation decree is very clear. The prisoner is can be transferred at any time of the judicial process. That means I could be deported before my next court hearing and maybe after that next court, court hearing, if it's a face-saving manner that the Egyptians are trying to implement before the next hearing. Mm -hmm. So I really hope that the prime minister is listening to me right now that, you know, raising a phone call, you know, the, the, for Peter, the... Tony Abbott, the Australian Prime Minister, he called President Sisi three times. He even called the President before Sisi, Sir Adli Mansour from the Interior Government. And then when Peter was left, <laughs> he called President Sisi to thank him and told him, could you release Fami and the other journalists? So, I don't know. I don't get it. Your trial, your retrial starts Monday. Do you still think this could happen if Mr. Harper were to involve himself before then? Of course. Of course it could happen. You know, it's very, the law is very clear. Any time of the judicial process, it could come from the judge, it could come from the authorities here. You know, I will be in that cage again, but, you know, I am now in a situation where I need the government support, and I'm very thankful to many of our people supporting me in Canada. You know, yesterday I heard there was 200 of very notable Canadians who are supporting me, and, you know, uh, we have a lot of thank yous <laughs> when we go back. <laughs> Why do you think Mr. Harper would not do that? I hope you can ask him, because you're talking about a, an, an innocent journalist here that has done nothing wrong, and um, you got to ask him that question. I don't know. How hard is it? I don't know. As abandoned as he feels by Canada's government, as abused as he feels by Egypt, Fami reserves a lot of his anger for Qatar. Qatar owns the Al Jazeera network and hates the government of Egypt. His is not only a story about freedom of expression, he says, but politics. We were pawns at the end of the day. That's what happened. We were right there in front of them and... There are people that we've talked to in this country even who say, you know what, 
The government of Qatar could not have been more happy when those three journalists went to jail because it gave them a perfect stick to keep hammering away at the Egyptian government. Now they could be seen as, in addition to everything else, as the jailers of journalists. Do you agree with that interpretation? Well, if it is true, you know, I'm not going to let it happen. You know, I'm not going to pay a price for my life because the Qataris want me in prison or the Egyptians want to keep me in prison or the Canadians are, are not taking advantage of an outing, you know, an exit for me out of this situation. I'm not going to let it happen. When we come back, Muhammad looks to the future. For 412 days, Mohamed Fami was a prisoner in Egypt. Last week, he was freed on bail after an appeals court ordered a retrial. Short of a last-minute deportation, his future now depends on convincing a new court that he is indeed innocent. You do go to retrial next week. Having um, gone through a trial already, uh, do you have faith in the Egyptian judicial system uh, to give you a fair trial, to, to have this turn out in a different way this time? You know, it would be very naive for anyone to believe that we are going to be acquitted because Al Jazeera remains in the minds of Egyptians as a public enemy number one. You know, that, that's, that's where it stops. I'm hopeful that the process will be expedited and that, you know, we're, we're trying to wonder what the scenarios are going to be. Of course, we want to be exonerated, but I don't see it happening. They, the, the judge might say, you know, we reduce the sentence to one year and it's time served and you can go home. But they still want the headlines that you're guilty and they want it in the history books, you know. Have you prepared yourself for all potential outcomes? I am, I am. Including I am. the possibility you might go back to prison? No, that one I cannot prepare myself for. And I really hope that the media understands that, you know, the journalism aspect of support for us three, in this case, is the most, it's our last line of defense, basically, because, you know, if, you know, being on this side of the microphone now, <laughs> I, I kind of understand more than ever what journalism means. You know, if, if uh, you and me are in this business because we hope to make a change, and now that I'm here, I could see it, how, you know, journalists covering my case has made a difference on many levels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to keep the pressure on. But at the end of the day, it will be a decision by a, an Egyptian judge. That, that is correct. Even journalists don't have any control over. So are you prepared for all possibilities? I am prepared. I mean, I, mean, I, I have to be prepared. <laughs> I have no other choice, but, um, you know, um, we're always putting different strategies on, you know, and I will do whatever it takes to get out of this case. You know, I've done nothing wrong. Are you getting support now from Al Jazeera, the better support than you had the first time round? I'm still paying for my legal defense. You're paying for them? That is correct. Al Jazeera is not paying no, for your lawyer? No, I'm not paying for my lawyers. Why? They never did. Um, we have our differences in the choice of lawyers. Did Al Jazeera pay for your bail? Uh, they're in the process, you know, but here's another point, you know, um, if I didn't have this kind of money ready at home, $33,000. U.S., I, I think, more than 40 Canadian. Yeah, 40 Canadian, exactly. 40 Canadian, I, I had them because I thought I was going to be deported and I wanted money in Canada. Would you have expected that Al Jazeera should have paid your bail immediately? Of course, because, you, 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 you know, you expect that there is a chance of bail and money to be paid, and that is what crisis management is about, and that is what management is about, is that prepare yourself. You know, if a revolution started tomorrow morning somewhere else, you'd find Al Jazeera, like any other channel, flying in their satellites and their journals and their planes, you know, but why did this, this didn't happen yet, you know? And uh, I just hope they take my, my issues Seriously. You've told us that you're considering suing Al Jazeera for negligence in the way they've handled your case. Is that, are you still thinking that? 
that is something that it's not on the table at the moment. Um, You're not I, there yet. It's not. I'm not there yet. Um, you know, nobody wants drama in his life, and I've raised these concerns, and I'm hoping that they take him very seriously, because um, you know, if you wronged to that extent. It's very hard to just let it go. You know, you have dignity, you have pride. You know, if you let it go, then you know it's it's not good for you as a human being. I mean, it's and you know it's up to them. It's the ball. The ball is in their court, basically. Yeah. They want to compensate me for these mistakes. They want to take care of their staff, especially a guy like me who has defended them in court. You've had many, many months to think about this. Why? Why do you think? You didn't get that the kind of support that I think you're right. Most journalists would hope and assume that they would get from their employer. I think it's. Uh, I think, like I said in the beginning, it's negligence, but you know, it's epic negligence. You know, you can any any network will, will do mistakes. Any network will have some sort of, you know, issues that you know, you know, that don't you know, work out. You know, but when it's when it's when it's life threatening, and you're in a situation like this. And you have no control. You're behind bars. No, it's something to to really uh, think about. And you know, I would hope that the highest levels of the network would engage directly and try to solve these problems. Depending on what happens in court, uh, there's so many different ways. I guess your life can unfold going mm -hmm. forward. But if if it unfolds the way you want, how do you see the future? Where are you two years from now? Five years from now? Ten years from now? Yeah, you think about that a lot when you're in prison. <laughs> no, I think I will take a step back. I want to start a family, move to Canada with my wife to be, and uh, just take a step back. I'm, or I'm I'm writing a book with my colleague Peter Greste about this whole ordeal, and it's sort of a therapy to just kind of put it behind you, but make sure the whole backstory is out there and everything is out there. And, um, you know, we'll take a step back. I'll be in journalism, but you're not going to see me on the front lines anytime soon. No? You've had enough of that now? For now. For now. You know, I, I, I need to you know, gather myself first before I can, you know, just be on the ground and take any more stress in. You know. Mohamed Fahmi, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much. Now, it's important to know that for months, the Fifth Estate has been in contact with Al Jazeera, and managers there deny many of the allegations you've heard here tonight. The head of Al Jazeera English told us that the channel was and remains fully licensed and legal to operate in Egypt, and he denies any suggestion his channel was ever instructed or pressured to slant coverage in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood. Al Jazeera, he says, is committed to the highest standards of journalism and to the safety of all of its journalists. As for supporting Mohamed Fahmi and his family, he says the network has continued to pay his salary during his incarceration, but as Fahmi points out, it is not paying for his lawyers. For more information about Al Jazeera and this story, go to the Fifth Estate website. But for now, stay with us. We'll be right back.